all to today's lecture. Um, I am Sam Galgano. I am an assistant professor of radiology at the University of Alabama in Birmingham, where I serve as the fellowship director and the section chief of the abdominal imaging section. And it is my great pleasure to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Sandy Lal, who is the chair of the Department of Radiology at the University of Florida, Jacksonville and is a full professor and also serves as the chief of the abdominal imaging section and the program director of the abdominal imaging fellowship. Um, Dr. Lal is a very impressive academic radiologist who's been at a few institutions and has amassed over 100 peer reviewed publications in the literature. Um, Dr. Lal is a fellow of the Society of Abdominal Radiology, which is a great organization that I'm also part of. And today she is going to give us a talk on cystic pancreatic lesions, which is a topic near and dear to my heart. So thank you, Dr. Law, and I look forward to this talk. Thank you, Sam, for that lovely introduction. And uh, thank you to Health, uh, Health for the World for giving me this opportunity. Um, well, good day to everybody. I'm sure it's different times in different uh, countries, but welcome to this talk and hope you're all staying safe. So without further ado, let's get into cystic pancreatic lesions, a very common uh, entity that we encounter um, almost every day when we're working. I have no relevant disclosures. So talking about cystic lesions, with the increased use of CT and MRI, we see these incidental cystic lesions every day. And it's really important to figure out if these are benign or malignant, and what should be the appropriate follow-up guidelines. So commonly, these are seen on CT scan, and on CT, we can actually talk about location, a little bit about internal architecture, enhancement, calcification, et cetera. But MRI, MRCP are, is another great modality to look at these cystic lesions because um, it provides much more detailed characterization in terms of whether the lesion is communicating with the pancreatic duct, whether there's complexity, septations, extent of main pancreatic duct involvement, um, and many other things that you don't see as well on CT imaging. So here's a case in which we see obviously a very dilated, tortuous main pancreatic duct multiple dilated side branches, and some sort of a narrowing or stricture at about the level of the pancreatic neck. So we know that there's some sort of stricture or obstruction at this site. And MRI has the advantage of other sequences which help us with tissue characterization. And we obviously see that post contrast, there's this non-enhancing lesion or poorly enhancing lesion in the pancreatic head and you see that mildly hyperintense lesion on T2-weighted imaging, this turned out to be a pancreatic neoplasm. Now, what is the role of endoscopic ultrasound? Um, in the United States, this is a very commonly used modality. In fact, almost uh, all suspicious cystic pancreatic lesions go on for endoscopic ultrasound. On EUS, again, we are right there with the ultrasound probe. So you can look at internal architecture really well, septations, nodules, solid areas, vascular invasion, and adjacent lymphadenopathy. Plus, you can aspirate the cyst, you can biopsy a suspicious area, and in contrast to a percutaneous biopsy or aspiration, there's very little risk of spillage of contents into the abdominal cavity. So these are all huge advantages of EUS. When we look at the cyst fluid on EUS, there are certain markers that we look at for each of these lesions. And these are usually amylase, CEA. Those are the two common ones that we would see on cyst aspiration. So typically, um, I'll go over this in detail with each of the lesions. Um, and also in the EUS, obviously, one can do cytology, look for malignant cells, inflammatory, inflammatory cells, or mucin. And that would basically clinch the diagnosis when you're finally um, you know, looking at this lesion. 
So let's start classifying these cystic lesions. Now, there's a host of cystic lesions that can be neoplastic and non-neoplastic. So today, because of um, time constraints, I'll be discussing uh, five of the most common lesions that you will encounter in practice. So starting with non-neoplastic cysts, we'll start with the most common cyst that we see, which is a pseudocyst. Other cysts are congenital cysts or lymphoepithelial cysts, which can be present in the pancreas. In terms of cystic neoplasms, the three commonest ones I'd say are the serous cyst adenomas or serous tumors, the mucinous cystic neoplasms are called MCNs for short, and the intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasms or IPMN. This was sort of a discovery around the 90s. Before this, we didn't really understand that there was an intraductal mucinous entity called IPMN. And then we look at a, a tumor that commonly undergoes cystic degeneration, which is the solid papillary epithelial neoplasm, um, uh, which is seen in younger women. So when you look at a cystic lesion, what is important? Number one, presentation. Are they presenting with pain uh, or other symptoms? What is the age of the patient? What is the gender of the patient? What is the location of the lesion? All of these are very important when you're putting your differential diagnosis together. And you know, the time you forget one of these important things like age, you may be barking up the wrong tree. So you need to be cognizant of this, these uh, particular uh, entities. Let's start with pseudocysts. These are some of the commonest cysts we encounter. They make up about 85% of cystic lesions in the pancreas. One of the most important things in pseudocysts is they've got to have a history of either alcohol use or pancreatitis. You can't just call every cyst you see, perhaps this is a pseudocyst, because you have to have the relevant history. In the absence of this history, you must put in a mucinous cystic neoplasm in your differential. So the pseudocysts in terms of age, they can be seen at any age. Typically, men are more commonly involved and that's not because men are more alcoholic or anything, that's just one of the demographics. Um, alcohol use is usually present. There's usually a history of pancreatitis. You could see these anywhere in the pancreas, head, unsnate process, neck, body, tail, and they have no malignant potential. That's important to remember. Size can be very variable. You can see a pseudocyst that's one centimeter, or a pseudocyst that's 25 centimeters. Uh, it can vary. So here's your classic look at pseudocysts on MRI. We see a very nicely localized loculated fluid collection, a little mild enhancement perhaps of this wall, which is a pseudo wall really. And then we see a little bit of mural nodularity or some complexity sometimes, but typically, this stuff does not enhance a lot. Usually whatever complexity is related to maybe fibrin, hemorrhagic debris, exudates, proteinaceous stuff, but usually there should not be enhancing mural nodularity in a pseudocyst. Starting with the second common lesion, and these lesions are the so-called grandmother lesions or serous cyst adenomas, which are called SCA for short. These have a particular demographic and that is usually in the older female age group. These make up about just under 40% of cystic neoplasms. The five-year survival is fantastic. When's the last time we've heard a five-year survival of 100%? Not that common, right? Uh, they, they can be microcystic, which means they have tiny cysts, which are just a couple of millimeters in size, in diameter. They can be macrocystic, at which time these can be confused with mucinous neoplasms. And they can be oligocystic, in which they really don't have a lot of cystic change. 
So just remember that all the serous cystadenomas have that classic microcystic appearance. They can also have different appearances morphologically. Now, when we look at the demographics and clinical aspects of serous cystadenomas, these tend to be in the older population. Females are much more commonly affected than males. There's usually not a huge history of alcohol abuse, usually not a huge history of pancreatitis. Again, like pseudocysts, that these can be seen anywhere uh, within the pancreas, head, body, tail, neck, wherever. And malignant potential, as we said, is extremely rare, like almost zero. So when we look at these lesions, you'll see them as a cluster of grapes, a whole bunch of cysts that are hanging out together, usually in a fairly well circumscribed lesion. In the center, we have a bit of a fibrovascular core that you can see enhancing on CT and MRI. Usually the locules are greater than six in number, usually smaller than two centimeters, each individual locule. The lesion itself has a super sharp interface with the adjacent parenchyma. And even though these lesions tend to be decently large, they typically will not cause high grade obstruction of the main pancreatic duct. So, you know, that is very important because obstructing lesions tend to be more desmoplastic and, and tend to be malignant. So when we look at it on, say, MRI, you're seeing this lesion, very circumscribed, maybe a little lobular, but you see tons of little cysts forming the bulk of this lesion, and then perhaps this is part of the fibrovascular core. Let's see some more examples, but before that, I want to have this picture embedded in your brains as to, this is the gross specimen of a serous cystadenoma, and you see these little chambers in there, chambers like the honey chambers in a honeycomb. Just a beautiful example of what these lesions look like on cut specimens. And there really isn't any other lesion in the pancreas that has this appearance. So on CT imaging, we see a mildly lobular but circumscribed lesion with multiple cystic elements, some enhancing septations which make up the cyst walls. And on another case, we see the central scar, which is kind of a classic feature in a serous cystadenoma, but is seen in under 20%. So you can't rely on this sign alone. Mainly it's the microcystic elements that you focus on and the very clear demarcation with the adjacent parenchyma. Um, this is another lesion. Sometimes they're not as easy to see or describe, but this was another serous cyst adenoma in a middle-aged lady. The one thing I wanted to point out in this picture is that unlike an adenocarcinoma, which would right away invade this vessel, uh, the serous cystadenoma is just laying calmly alongside and really not doing anything much to this vessel at all. Another example of a large serous cystadenoma. Now, remember, when they get large, especially when they are larger than four centimeters, something happens to them in which they can actually start causing symptoms and they can actually start obstructing. So remember that when a serous cystadenoma gets larger than four centimeters, the growth pattern changes, and these tend to grow much faster than smaller lesions. When you put an attenuation value on it, these are just, just a little bit above simple fluid. This turned out to be 15 pounds per units. All right, next step. Cyst fluid analysis, and this is extremely important in serous neoplasms. At times when there is a borderline lesion which you cannot really characterize, you want to look at the cyst fluid after an endoscopic ultrasound. One of the most striking features of serous cystadenomas is the vascular epidermal growth factor which is a factor that causes growth of the lesion is actually higher than any other cystic lesion in the pancreas. 
So VEGF of greater than 16,000 is fairly characteristic of a serous dadenoma. The other thing it contains is glycogen. This is also a very specific finding in serous dadenomas. Obviously, you're not going to have a ton of amylase, that's more in pseudocysts, and you're not going to have mucin, that's more in mucinous lesions. So endoscopic aspiration should be sent for VEGF greater than 16,000, and you should also look for glycogen in these lesions. This is what I was talking about, the novel growth pattern. Small tumors grow 0.1 centimeter every year, just a couple of millimeters max. But tumors that are greater than four centimeters start exploding. They can grow up to two centimeters every year. And what happens is because of sheer size, they can start causing a lot of pain. And finally, they can cause obstruction of the pancreatic duct. So. These need to be reported when they are larger than four centimeters. Now, let's look at a mother lesion. The next lesion that you'll encounter sometimes is the mucinous cystic neoplasms. Now, we are in the danger zone here, danger zone of malignancy in the mother lesions. These are typically seen in women 30 to 50 years mom lesions, you know, now we're seeing older moms as well. Everybody's busy in careers, etc. Prevalence of these lesions is about 45% of all cystic neoplasms. One of the very important findings in mucinous lesions is since they're very common in women and they may have an embryologic origin that's similar to the ovarian uh, origin, these lesions tend to have ovarian stroma and may even mimic ovarian neoplasms on imaging, and they can also express estrogen receptors. So that is why it is important that when you're looking at a lesion in a middle-aged or sort of a mom-aged lady, you have to think of mucinous neoplasms. And one thing to remember is that when they become larger than six centimeter, there is a much higher incidence of malignancy in the mucinous lesions. So let's look at the clinical and demographic features of mucinous neoplasm. Again, to repeat, these occur in middle-aged lesions, in middle-aged women. These are mother lesions. They are much, much, much more common in females, almost exclusively 30 to 50 year age group. There's usually not a history of alcohol abuse or pancreatitis. And if it's there, it's very, very much in the background. These tend to have a specific location. Remember like pseudocysts and serous cystadenomas that could occur anywhere. The MCNs have a predilection for arising in the body and tail of the pancreas. Their malignant potential according to size and complexity can range from moderate to high. On CT uh, imaging, we see a large cystic mass in this patient who's 48 years old. We see some enhancing septations. The loculations here are fairly large. They don't look anything like our serous neoplasms. On, on, on um, post-contrast imaging, we see that there's a thickish enhancing wall and we see enhancing mural nodularity. This lesion is a very concerning lesion. This should not be called a pseudocyst and sat on. This needs to be resected right away because the chances of malignancy are very high. All right, now let's look at MRI. So here's a gradient echo T1. We see a little, you know, a mildly hyperintense lesion. And we see some mural nodularity on the T2-weighted images and post-contrast images. On post-contrast, we see that the wall is a little bit thick, and we see a mural nodule enhancing right in here. So MRI is just beautiful for looking at mucinous lesions because we can see the internal architecture really well, just like we could with the serous. Same thing with the mucinous. We want to look for those septations, the thickness of the septations, the mural nodules, the internal solid components, the enhancement, the thick wall, 
the rest of the parenchyma, all of that stuff is very important. When we look at the cyst fluid and we analyze on EUS, we notice that obviously the cytology is mainly mucin. Mucin is an important part of these lesions. Now, one thing to remember is that these lesions are not primarily from the duct. These originate from the asana cells or the actual parenchyma of the pancreas. And that is the most important differentiating feature between a mucinous neoplasms and an intraductal mucinous lesion or IPMN. In these lesions, you can have slightly elevated CEA, but it's usually less than 500. The vascular epidermal growth factor is less than serous neoplasms. It's usually less than 16,000, but greater than 8,500. So putting the CEA, the VEGF, and the cytology of mucin together, pretty much you can clinch the diagnosis of a mucinous neoplasm on imaging and after EUS. Now, the third important lesion, important and fairly common, I'd say, um, you know, we never used to see so many lesions, cystic lesions in the pancreas before, but now a lot of patients are coming in for trauma or appendicitis or other things and getting a CT scan. And now you've discovered this incidental cystic lesion and many times these turn out to be IPMNs. So there are two types of IPMN. I'm gonna talk about the first type, which is the main duct IPMN. In this tumor, what you see is a mucinous lesion that arises within a part of the main duct. And what it does is it sits there as a little excrescence within the duct and starts producing a lot of mucin. And what happens with that is the duct gets dilated. It gets really tortuous, a little redundant. And this is the classic look of a main duct IPMN. So the classic features are dilatation of the main pancreatic duct fairly diffusely and a bulging ampulla, which can be seen on CT or MRI. This ampulla on endoscopic ultrasound or ERCP looks like a classic open fish mouth appearance. And this is the fish mouth that it looks like literally exactly the same. And that's because the ampulla is dilated and just pouring out mucin when you look from the inside. So bulging and fish mouth appearance of the ampulla. Now, as you start accumulating mucin, you tend to get into ductal strictures and it can lead into chronic pancreatitis as well as well as atrophy. So sometimes it's difficult to differentiate at the first shot a chronic pancreatitis and a main duct IPMN. And there are certain nuances that can tell you the difference, but be aware that you know sometimes it's not that easy. This is a classic example of a main duct IPMN, T2-weighted sequence. You see dilated duct, very dilated, and you see sort of gray looking globules floating around in the main duct. This is a really big main duct, by the way. This is the classic appearance of mucin floating in a sort of, uh, in a dilated pancreatic duct. So there's fluid and mucin all floating together. And sometimes you'll see these excrescences, which are solid areas, which are again, highly concerning. In this patient, you see the dilated main pancreatic duct, but you've got these enhancing nodules within the duct, which is very concerning for a malignant IPMN. Indicators of malignancy are number one, mural nodularity. Number two, main duct diameter of greater than 10 millimeters and or diffuse dilatation of the main duct. But remember, if you don't have mural nodules, you can't say, oh gosh, this is a benign IPMN. No, that's not ruling out anything. You still have to be suspicious that there could be a lurking malignancy.
And this is the dilated mean pancreatic duct in this patient. When we look at the clinical and demographic features of this cystic lesion, we see that these are actually common in the older age group, much more common in the elderly, usually much more common in men. There's usually not a huge history of alcohol abuse or pancreatitis. IPMNs can arise anywhere in the pancreas, and the malignant potential can be low to high depending on the internal features of the IPMN. So remember, a different demographic, elderly men. Now, if you were to see the first time a 69-year-old gentleman comes into the clinic and gets a CT scan and you see a five centimeter lesion, I mean, you should not be thinking about serous neoplasms and you shouldn't be thinking about mucinous neoplasms. You should be thinking either uh, IPMN or you should be thinking about some sort of post-inflammatory uh, pseudocyst or other lesions. So that's how age, demographics, appearance, and location help you in coming to a final diagnosis. Cyst fluid analysis for IPMN. Basically, nothing major, but cytology can be malignant in these lesions. Amylase is variable, CEA, now, the CEA in these lesions is higher than other lesions. It's not almost always there, but this is the one marker that you might want to look at in the IPMNs, especially the main duct and malignant IPMNs, um, because um, uh, we have mucin in it, because mucin is being produced by the IPMN, and cytology can be malignant, and CEA can also be high. So these would be the two or three markers that you would be considering. Now, moving on to the other type of IPMN, which I would say is more common, is the side branch IPMN. This is basically a small ductal neoplasm within one of the side ducts. So basically, it dilates that side duct and starts looking like a little cluster of grapes. This is a very classic appearance. Now, the most important thing when you see something that you think is a side branch IPMN is looking for a ductal communication. If you don't establish a ductal communication, then it's very hard to say, is this a small mucinous lesion or is this an IPMN? Here's a little lesion, it's lying quite close to the main duct, it's likely got a ductal connection. And sometimes doing multiplanar reconstructions can show you that tiny filamentous ductal element that connects it to one of the larger ducts. So this is your classic, cluster of grapes, bunch of grapes appearance with that tiny little duct connecting to a larger duct, branch duct IPMN. Lesions less than three centimeters have a much lower risk of malignancy. And here's a larger image showing the lesion um, in good perspective and showing the connection. Here's another example of a branch duct IPMN. Again, you're seeing they lie pretty close to the main duct because that's where the side branches lie. And typically you can look at the ductal connection and establish a ductal connection. Again, they have some complexity. They look like a cluster of small cysts. Um, I thought I had an MRCP, but I guess I don't. Anyway, um, Moving on to the one of the other lesions that we need to know about, which is the solid and papillary epithelial neoplasms. Now, these occur in a very different demographic. These are called the daughter lesions. They occur in younger girls, teenage girls, or, you know, early 20s kind of lesion. Um, and this is also a very specific lesion because it really has a very low malignant potential but can cause symptoms by sheer size or location. These lesions, if you look at the demographics and clinical features of these pens, solid papillary neoplasms, these tend to occur in younger women. They're predominantly female 
compared to other lesions, pretty much all female. Alcohol abuse, usually no history of that, typically not a huge history of pancreatitis. These can occur anywhere within the pancreas and they have a very low malignant risk or low malignant potential. So typically these are seen, this was a very good article from radiology on pseudopapillary tumors of the pancreas. And um, I suggest that this could be one of the reads that you look into. Uh, these are typically seen in younger women, late teens or 20s. In 22%, you can actually see these in children, rare lesions, but can be seen. These are usually asymptomatic, but when they grow to a certain size, then you may see um, symptoms like a little bit of ductal obstruction, pain, um, just bloating, those kind of nonspecific symptoms. Even though they have a very low malignant potential, it's seen that in a very small percentage of these lesions, unusual metastases can be seen in 7 to 16%. So that is what the dilemma of these solid and papillary neoplasms is that the bulk of them are very, very benign. They're very circumscribed. They can be resected easily, but a very small percentage, I'd say about 10% of them will all of a sudden metastasize. So this is a lesion you cannot take for granted, especially since these are in younger people. So, um, on CT imaging and MRI, they tend to be large masses. They tend to be encapsulated. One of the very important findings here is a pseudocapsule or a capsule around this lesion. And this capsule can actually be T2 hypo intense when you're looking on MRI. Internally, these tend to be very complex with mixed attenuation because what happens is that they start off as small solid lesions. They start off in the parenchyma, but as they grow, they start undergoing cystic and hemorrhagic degeneration. After a while, all of that degeneration leads to calcification. Uh, it could be rim-like, it could be within the hemorrhagic areas, and um, they can look very alarming and complex. But once you consider the demographics and the fact that they are fairly well circumscribed lesions, you want to suspect a spin in that particular age group in females. Main pancreatic duct dilatation is quite uncommon, but rarely one can see it if the lesion is sitting right on the main duct. Accuracy of imaging of cystic lesions overall is about 60 to 80%. The fact is that you know, there are a lot of these lesions that if they have a characteristic appearance and characteristic demographic, then, you know, great, awesome. But many of them don't have it. And we are stuck now deciding which is which. So the accuracy after all of this and the cross-sectional imaging is still only about 60 to 80%. Here's this morphologic overlap of this unilocular lesion. This unilocular lesion turned out to be a mucinous lesion. This turned out to be a branch duct IPM, and this was a pseudocyst, and this was a spen. So even though we think we can characterize them, many times there's so much overlap that we have to depend on uh, EUS cytology and fluid analysis to really come to the correct diagnosis. Because honestly, Doing surgery on the pancreas is not a walk in the park. It is a tough surgery. It can have a lot of complications, uh, ductal leaks, pancreatitis, so many issues when you touch the pancreas. So one has to be quite precise when you come to the final diagnosis. And here's another morphologic overlap in which you have a lesion that has multiple cystic areas and areas of calcification, each of them 
is something that you didn't expect. Looking at this lesion, you think, gosh, this is a serous adenoma. It's got calcification, it's circumscribed, it's lobular, it's got, this turned out to be an IPM. And this was a serous adenoma. This was a mucinous lesion with dystrophic calcification. Mucin also has a propensity to calcify. So remember that you can see mucinous lesions with a calcification fairly commonly. And this turned out to be a solid papillary neoplasm that calcified. What about small cysts? Cysts that are less than three centimeters. Now, many times we are stuck again with accurate diagnosis. One thing to remember is ductal communication. This can be your friend. When you see a ductal communication, you can pretty much call it a branch duct IPMN. And remember that out of all the modalities, MRCP is excellent for morphology and better characterization of small cysts. This one was a lymphoepithelial cyst. This turned out to be a branch duct IPMN. This turned out to be a SPEN. And this turned out to be a small serous neoplasm. So the American College of Radiology has a beautiful flow chart and it's a imaging follow-up guidelines this came out in uh, 2011. Dr. Mike McCurry was one of the authors. Unfortunately, Dr. McCurry passed away from uh, a few years ago. And Dr. Megabo uh, is one of the authors in this uh, beautiful uh, flowchart from radiology. So the way you look at an incidental cystic lesion detected on CT and MRI, or even ultrasound, if it's less than two centimeters, one can do a single follow-up in a year, preferably by MRI. If it's stable, then it's usually benign and doesn't need further workup. Now, if it's larger, if it's two to three centimeters, then you want to go for further characterization. So recommend MRI or MRCP. And if it is something that you cannot characterize after this, you can do an early follow-up. That's pretty safe way to follow up these lesions. Or you can do, um, if it's a branch duct IPMN, one can follow it up every six months for two years. If it's a serous acestadenoma, you can follow up every two years. If now it's a lesion greater than three centimeters, and it has features of a serous cyst adenoma. You really don't need to do much, but once it's greater than four centimeters, you want to consider resection. If it's an uncharacterized cystic mass or other cystic neoplasm, then definitely you want to go for EUS and cyst aspiration, and you resect depending on what you find on the aspirate and also on the comorbidities and risk. Obviously, if it's a three centimeter lesion that's in a younger person causing abdominal pain, you want to make sure it's not a malignancy. And if it is, then you want to resect it. But a lot of times, if these lesions are just sitting there, the patient is 85 years old, not causing a lot of symptoms, you might want to just follow up the lesion with imaging. So follow-up guidelines are for serous cystadenomas, just to reiterate, just to keep this in the back of your minds, serous cystadenomas less than four centimeters, which are asymptomatic, you can do an annual imaging surveillance, and that's actually good enough. But if they're more than four centimeters and symptomatic, then they will need surgery. Um, asymptomatic thin-walled unilocular lesions less than three centimeters or side branch IPMNs, one can do a CT or MRI at six months and then at 12 months interval. This would suffice. If they remained um, stable, you can get another follow-up and then stop. Cystic lesions with more complex features that are growing greater than one centimeter per year should be followed up closely. This growth pattern that's fast is one of the features that should be concerning to you. And in these patients, you must follow up more closely. Uh, and then you can also recommend for resection based on how fast the growth is. And symptomatic cystic lesions or neoplasms with a high malignant potential or a lesion that's greater than three centimeters, definitely you want to A, follow up with MRCP, 
look at the EUS and perhaps refer for surgical resection. Now, in the radiology report, what should you be mentioning? What is important? Number one, once you've looked at the patient's age and sex and decided on what you think this lesion is, the minimum that your report needs to have is location and size of the lesion. Typically, we will give three dimensions, AP, transverse, and cranial cordat size. Some, uh, some centers even do volumetrics. They'll give a volume of a cystic lesion. You can do that as well if you have the um, software. In terms of morphology, you want to look at unilocular versus multilocular right away. You want to look at septations, number of septations, size of the individual cystic areas, uh, and other you know, factors such as margins with the rest of the parenchyma. Is it a circumscribed lesion? Is it not well delineated? Then you move on to other features like mural nodularity. Are there mural nodules within the cystic lesion? Are there calcifications? Is there a central scar? And if the lesion actually communicates with the main pancreatic duct, then um, you need to also talk about main pancreatic duct diameter. So ductal communication needs to be talked about. And then finally, we talk about vascular relationships of this lesion. In the pancreas, any lesion that is going up for resection needs a full vascular uh, profile section in which you talk about uh, the hepatic artery, the SMA, the SMV, you talk about uh, you know, other vessels, aorta, IVC, everything that's in the vicinity of the lesion should be cleared before a patient goes for any type of surgery. So um, a lot to cover in sort of a short time, but in summary, cystic pancreatic lesions, presentation matters, patient age and gender matters. Location is also important when coming up with the correct diagnosis. Imaging, especially cross-sectional imaging, is crucial in terms of location, loculation, nodularity, and enhancement features. Septated cysts, remember, typically tend not to be pseudocysts because pseudocysts are just cysts that arise because of inflammation and leakage of pancreatic juices. These are not true cysts. They don't have an epithelial lining, and usually they don't show a ton of septations. Complex cystic lesions with septations and nodules have a much higher risk of malignancy. If you see biliary obstruction or ductal dilatation, this can be a predictor of malignancy. And if there is a lesion that you really cannot characterize based on all these findings that we've discussed, this lesion may need an EUS finally to get aspiration and fine needle aspiration biopsy and fluid analysis, um, which will finally give you the correct answer and guide you towards the right course of treatment. Thank you very much. And I hope that in this time, I've been able to share some uh, nuances of cystic pancreatic lesions. And uh, I'd like to say a very special thank you to Dr. Bosley from the MD Anderson Cancer Center who helped me preparing this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lahal. That was a great talk. Um, and thank you for everyone who's commented and, and, and thank Dr. Lal. Um, so far, I, I have only seen one question and I think it partially got covered in uh, some of the later slides. Uh, Dr. Z had asked, what is the initial test of choice for pancreatic cystic lesions? And then are these lesions associated with smoking as well? So I think we did talk about the initial test of choice. Ultimately, it sort of matters how big it is or, or kind of what it looks like. But 
Um, do you have any knowledge that these are associated with smoking? I mean, pancreatic adenocarcinomas are, but I'm not sure whether there's any major association with smoking in the cystic pancreatic lesions. Uh, but you know, yeah, go ahead, Sam. No, I was gonna say the only thing I know about is it, smoking increases your risk of getting pancreatitis. And so I, you, theoretically, if you're talking pseudocysts, it could increase the risk of that, but that's all I know of. Well, that's good to know. The thing is that, you know, uh, you have to go with what modality you have in your specific hospital. And many times, you know, ult ultrasound can detect cystic lesions. Many centers follow up by ultrasound. And if you have a CT or MRI, then it's, then it's wonderful. But, you know, it depends on what, uh, what imaging modalities you have and how commonly available they are. I know that many hospitals, um, I, I, I was educated in India, we only had one CT scanner in the hospital. It was hard to get patients in. So many times we would follow up by ultrasound, which was more readily available. Thank you. Thank you. The only other thing I would add to people uh, that it, these are a complicated topic and there are a lot of different guidelines for follow-up. Um, there's actually a large study going on in the United States to try to figure out what is best. So, so keep in mind that while we, we went over some of the guidelines, there are other guidelines that exist. There are gastroenterology guidelines, there are Japanese guidelines that are different from, um, so different societies have different guidelines and it's very confusing to figure out. And so the most important thing you need to do to figure out how to follow is to ask the people in your institution what guidelines they're following because, um, you know, everyone's using some combination thereof, but it, it is a rather unique thing, the pancreatic cysts. Right, and there's, uh, in the um, IPMNs, especially the branch duct IPMNs, we have the Sendai criteria, like Dr. Galgano mentioned, from Japan, and it basically, uh, the follow-up guidelines depend on the size of the lesion initially and how often to follow up. So that's the Sendai criteria, S-E-N-D-A-I. Um, I can see somebody from Bhutan. Hi, Dr. Dechen. <laughs> That's close to my heart. What a beautiful country. Um, in any case, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to email me. Uh, my email is on the uh, slide right now. It's chandana.lal at jax.ufl.edu. But it has been a great pleasure to be here with all of you to give you this talk. I hope that you will retain a few pointers from today's talk and uh, hopefully that'll help you in the future in diagnosing cystic pancreatic lesions. I wanna thank Health for the World, Dr. Galgana, Shreya, Dr. Rihani for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you all and have a great day or thank evening. You. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lal. Thank you, Dr. Galgona. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. Bye-bye.